on and 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 I'm recording this um, and and it was so embarrassing. I mean, it was embarrassing and so discombobulating. I mean, they were like swearing, they were drawing lewd pictures on on drawing boards and just kind of going crazy. And they were like kids. I asked my son what he thought of it. And he said, oh, they're just trying to give a big F you to the adult world. I said, yeah, well, you know, I understand that, but you know, you'd hope they have better things to do. <laughs> I know, I know. You would, you would think that they would have better things to do, but um, why they decided to, to um, uh, land on me uh, i know how do they find you that's well, the weird thing the funny thing is is that um uh, zoom had uh left me a message or they said listen we know you're ho holding a meeting and you know we've noticed that there is um that there's no security on your meeting so we just want to warn you that that this is a possibility you know that people are going to um you know, potentially you're setting yourself up to uh, to have this this unfortunate thing happen, and in fact, it did happen almost as though they knew it was going to happen. Well, you know, there are some photographers that probably call like magnets this kind of uh, attention because of the subject matter in which they they're dealing. Mm -hmm. Luckily, my subject matter is rather boring. <laughs> <laughs> I um, mean, to the initial. To the right. initial viewer. Well, I, I, as as it is past six o'clock, I think I'm going to just say officially, hello everyone, and welcome to the what is it now? Oh, April, <laughs> April 2022 uh, edition of Photo Book Banter. Um, my name is George Slade. Many of you know me, um, and I'm really really happy to be joined by Stuart Rome, who is coming to us from. Uh, the Rome Studios, the Presto Pictures Studios um, in Philadelphia or outside of Philadelphia? No, right in the city. Right in the in the heart of the city. Um, I have I have cousins in Philadelphia. I need to get back and see them sometime, and then I can go visit Presto. What is Presto Pictures, by the way? Well, you know, my very first business card when I was twenty something years old was the magician from the tarot deck. I I'm sorry to say, or no, not really sorry, but it was, you know, it was a, the times, late 60s, early 70s, mm -hmm. and Presto Pictures was the magician's word, Presto, mm -hmm. but a Presto, you know, is Italian also, it means like right now, and photography was that thing that was right now, the so right now. Presto Pictures, it sounds, and also it sounds fabulous. <laughs> And and indeed, you are fabulous, especially in the shirt you're wearing today. <laughs> Tell me this is a gift shirt. of Bruce Carpenter, a good friend of mine from Indonesia. Uh huh. And you you had a little bit of time in Indonesia, and we're not going to dwell on that. But the but the images that you made were of, of trance and ritual, and were quite splendid and sort of terrifying at the same time. Um, you know, that's the. Um... The definition of romanticism, something that's beautiful and terrifying at the same time. Um, well, Stuart, it's really great to see you. We we have a shared history that goes back at least at least 10 years and maybe a little further than that. Um, I know that we were both friends of Mary Virginia Swanson and Temple and that little crowd uh, in the ninth floor apartment at Bleecker and Broadway. Yes, they're in Hawaii at the moment. <laughs> they're in Hawaii. <laughs> they are. The two of them? The Temple, Samani, and Lisa Kremens, as far as I know, that the three of them are. Oh my gosh. That would be fun to be sitting in on that group. Tell me about it. What are we doing wrong here, Joy? <laughs> <laughs> We're just being too homebound. That's right. Um anyway, so so I I believe that. I believe I can remember Swan introducing us, but maybe I'm just making things up. But anyway, we, we were fortunate enough to get to spend time together working on a project called Signs and Wonders and um, attending the opening and events surrounding that exhibit. Um, 
what we're going to do tonight uh, is go through some of Stuart's uh, slideshow, and we're going to land on Signs and Wonders, even though it's not the most recent project. Um, the most recent project is suggested by the images right behind Stuart's head. Um, those, those holes are actually, well, this one, the two, three of the four are holes that we are sitting inside of, and they're they're tree trunks, hollowed out tree trunks, massive trees in California, right? Yeah, there's sequoias and, um, and redwoods that are still alive, some of them over 3,000 years old. Um, they have canopies that grow above them. And if there is an opening in the trunk and an opening at the top, which is a rare combination in a living tree, you can crawl inside. Mm -hmm. and photograph the canopy above. And each one is like a cathedral and a Rorschach at the same time. I was going to say that's a little terrifying and beautiful at the same time also. Yeah. Being yeah. inside of a massive tree with a hollow trunk, that's got to be a little... <laughs> well, you never know how far down you're going to end up. Ah. <laughs> I know there's a picture in the slideshow um, of you crawling out of or crawling into one of those spaces. And it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did this romantic. for about six years before. And then I got I was lucky enough to get a pretty a lucrative grant, which allowed me to hire um, rangers to work along with me. So those pictures were done by one of the rangers I worked with. Yeah, they were really great. All right, I'm going to share my screen and we'll dive into the PowerPoint here. And that's way too early in the or way too late in the PowerPoint. I would love to start there, but there are really fascinating things at the beginning too. Stop. If necessary, you can let me know and I can share my screen. Okay. Um, you got it? Not yet. Do you have yours queued up there? I think I might. I love your profile picture. It's kind of a William Tell image, isn't it? <laughs> but the thing is, I wasn't prepared for this. So whether I can get to it quickly enough is another story. All right. Uh, um, uh, uh, uh. It looks like, here it is. Presto. And I, can you see it? Can, how do I share my screen? <laughs> oh my God. Uh oh, you've gone blank. Yeah, I, oh, you know what I didn't do for, oh, here we go. There you go. So go backwards. There you go. Keep going. No, you're going forwards. You Got to go the other direction. Oh, okay. More, 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 more. Keep going. Keep going. There, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. There we are. And there. That's a good place to stop. So, you know, I, this is just by way of uh, an introduction is that, you know, I began my career in the 1970s as a photographer. And back then, um, most people look, look down on color photography as being lurid and commercial. Uh, and so all you had to do really was put color film in your camera to be, you know, staking out new ground. And as a young uh, um, photographer and someone who was interested in, you know, creating my own uh, language, I, I was really looking for uh, a way to speak that was my own. Mm -hmm. And so, and I had an amazing teacher, John Fall, who was a great 1970s photographer who encouraged me quite a bit. And I, and I also had, you know, great writing teachers and the, uh, you know, the, the cliche was to write what you know. So, you know, I started working with people who were close to me. Um, you know, I'd run away from home when I was in high school. I joined an ethnomusicology commune. You, you, people, you ran away or, or you drove away as soon as you had a license, right? Yeah, well, that, that's the way I describe it. As soon as I learned to drive, I left Fairfield, Connecticut, where I grew up. But I had to come back on a number of occasions to finish my world. But at one point, I joined a ethnomusicology commune where my older brother lived. And his best friend 
was the father of this young man. Yeah. And so uh, a couple of years later, I, you know, I, I'd come back there and I was living in a cabin right behind where this truck is. It had no electricity or running water, but I worked at Sonnabend Gallery uh, in New York three days a week photographing <laughs> their collections and they were showing my work for the very first time. And this was for a show that was to open at the Eastman House called Modern Mythologies. And yeah. it was, you know, influenced by writing by people like Roland Barthes, but it was yeah. images from things that I knew. I and, think it was, uh, I think it was very instructive that, that you had enough light power in that shed for a light bulb to read by and a record player to listen to music. Yeah, I had to run that from the big house that was in front of where the cabin I lived in. Right, right. And yeah, and you had to take showers in uh, the local high school or the go for a swim in the local pond before you went to work in the morning. It was pretty great, I got to say. I'm trying so to, anyways, yeah, that's how ahead. I got my start. That's how I got my start. And then you know the the um, the, the this these were some photographs from that show, Modern Mythologies, um, which was were the things that I knew and the things that were closest to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is near where I grew up, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, you know, there it's the great thing about photography is, uh, you know, Gary Winogrand used to talk about this: is that if you're if you're in the right place and you're prepared for things to happen, they do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I I set this picture up at glow time to photograph this series of uh, bridges and this golden cat car drove up the mother got out and the little kid got in the window as i was yeah. you know hitting the shutter it was extraordinary so yeah. you know photography oh, is a wonderful thing and you know yeah. this is fairfield connecticut this is for me the perfect um uh description of growing up in fairfield <laughs> you know it was a place filled with promise that was lost in the headless inferno I know, you know, and I love the writing of Dante, but this is the headless Dante with a, you know, purple grape crush can at his, <laughs> at his feet. Not even why. No. And, uh, you know, this is my Wagnerian portrait of uh, Basset Hound. And this and, is Valkyrie, and, right? Yeah, and, you know, the, the, the images came from my life, and so they were like, uh, many of them were diaristic. Um, and this was a failed romance. Uh, this is my uh, girlfriend at the time, um, Catherine, and we. She gave me my walking papers. I pulled. Uh, I pulled away with my, you know, my U-Haul truck filled with all my stuff. I saw her standing in the middle of the road. I got out, and made that picture <laughs> with my shadow on her chest. But you know, ten years later, we got married. Oh, I was going to say, you, you, you got dumped by a Catherine and then you married a Catherine. Yes, it's the, the same, same one. It's the same one. You know, I'm very loyal to Catherine's. Yes. So in the interim, though, um, you know, I was trying to figure out how to use the talents I had. Um, but I wasn't inter never really interested in, in the commercial world of photography, nor in, um, in making uh, a big um, uh, success in the art world either. I just wanted to have a great adventure. And so I, I you know, I was, I found myself working for archeologists, which was set, that tone was set by my experience at Wesleyan University. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just lost my light. Oh, you've been shadowed there, Sue. I, yeah, I've been shadowed. I don't know if you can see me so good. Oh. <laughs> it just keeps getting worse and worse. I know, how about this? This is from the other direction. Let's see how this works. How's that better? Oh, that's really lovely. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I drove to, um, after Catherine uh, broke up with me, I, I drove all my stuff cross, cross country. I was going to go to New Orleans, and my car broke down in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where Betty Hahn lived. Mm -hmm. So, I went to see her, and she took me in. She was my teacher from Rochester a great mentor and a good friend. And I went to the um, Albuquerque Museum and tried to sell them photographs from a series that I'd been working on. And they asked me, did I want to, do, do I like travel? <laughs> I said, sure. And they said, can you photograph studio work? And I said, sure. And so the, the director of the museum had a 1950s bubblegum machine on his desk and said, here, take this home. And bring me back a four by five transparency. Wow. So I went 
to the used bookstore, bought a book on studio lighting, bought two of those lights uh, and, and 5,500 Kelvin bulbs and went back and forth to a, 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 a lab until I got a perfect transparency. Nice. Went back to the, to the museum three days later as if it was no big deal and gave them a perfect transparency. And the next thing I knew I was working on this book, Maya Treasures of an Ancient Civilization with mm-hmm. some of the finest mm-hmm. and most you know, impressive Mayanists in the world. And I spent a year photographing objects as they came out of the ground or from uh, incredible collections in Latin America. Mm-hmm. And, and I, it was, a, it was a, a life-changing event for me. Well, speaking of, speaking of coming out of the ground, uh, the next picture I think um, has some remarkable emergences. Right, well, really, you know, Oops, sorry. Yeah. So um, you, what happened was the, uh, the, Maya, the Maya project got me a job teaching um, and starting a photo program at, in Philadelphia. From there, I, I'm, I went, uh, I, I, I had a gallery that was, that represented self-taught artists, many of which were from Haiti. And I was invited to go and photograph Andre Pierre who worked with Maya Darren, the great filmmaker um, from the 1950s, who did Meshes in the Afternoon. And uh, she, she, while she was working there, a young Jewish girl from Brooklyn, she became a voodoo priestess. And she studied with a guy named Andre Pierre, who was a great um, uh, painter as well. And I had the opportunity to actually work with Andre Pierre, you know, in, while he was in his probably mm-hmm. 70s or 80s at the time and um, then photographed trance in Haiti. The, right. the combination of the work I had done in Latin America and the work I had done in Haiti caught the interest of um, uh, an art dealer in Dallas who was working with the Nasher family that has the Nasher Museum. Mm-hmm. And they were interested in having somebody go to Indonesia and photograph their object collection, as well as w- what inspired it. So mm-hmm. I spent seven years photographing in Indonesia and um, I, I started putting together this idea that, you know, in images that I was making of trance, people spoke to the landscape and the landscape spoke back very clearly to people. And then when you went to places like the one you just saw, someone in the 10th century saw this spring and said, just like Rodin said, you know, to the materials he worked with, I can see anthropomorphic and zoomorphic imagery inside this material. I just need to reveal it. And that's mm-hmm. what happened here. So when I came home, I started looking for the same sort of thing. You know, there's a tradition in uh, in Asia of doing of collecting stones that have anthropomorphic or zoomorphic qualities, and it's called scholar stones. So I started making photographs like that. And this is in Eastern Oregon. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, yeah, this is. Uh, you know, what, what, towards the end of my uh, years living in Indonesia, I was I happened to be reading the first Jackson Pollock biography, and I was thinking, what would it be like to create an image which had one foot in the world that we recognize, but also was a trapdoor to thinking about the world in terms of abstraction and where that could lead you. Mm-hmm. And I thought of people like Agnes Martin, whose young childhood in woods created those lines that she made her language for the rest of her career. Mm-hmm. So this was the very first picture that became the, um, the, um, uh, the journey that was my book, my first book, Monograph mm-hmm. um, Forest. Right. And these are more from that forest series. And then? And then um, the forest book came out and you know it did fairly well. Uh, and the curator for the Southeast Museum of Photography asked me if I would create a body of work based on the changing Florida landscape. Um, and so I made a couple of trips down and, and landed on this idea of signs and wonders. I actually was inspired by that Leonard Cohen song called Anthem. And I was looking, yeah. And so this, this book was meant to be a recapitulation of lots of different ways that I worked in previously. Um, but also to experiment with new ways of working so that, you know, I might find something new. And so, you know, I thought of this book in many ways like a comic book, that it would create a visual dialogue like a Lind Ward book or, 
you know, I, I, I don't know um, uh, the people that are working more contemporaneously, but that would be like a, a conversation that didn't need words. Mm -hmm. And so the, the cover was this, mm -hmm. which in many ways is like a, an idea graph of the problems with the contemporary landscape. Yeah. Well, and, and then and then that dialogue had to expand. And I think that's one of the amazing things about about the book is that it isn't just a, 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 uni, a unilateral or a, a unified approach to the landscape and the questions of human presence in the landscape. It, it takes on three forms and, and the title Signs and Wonders is not just a title, but it's actually the different sections of the book. There's signs, there's and, subtitle drawn from nature, and then wonders, so signs and wonders. Um, but it didn't it didn't work out all that well as a comic book, wasn't that right? Well, you know, initially it didn't because the the museum who was doing the catalog didn't really understand what I was after. So when they sent me the first comp, it was all these pictures kind of garbled together, and so I said, you know what, I'll raise some of the money for the book. Let me take over the design. So I restructured it. So it did just the thing that I wanted it to do. So you know the the um, you know the printing's not that great. Uh, it's a pretty fast printed book, but I just love the way the book runs. Mm -hmm. It has this really beautiful um, you know dance in it that runs from signs, which is a chapter about what we got wrong with the, what we were offered in the contemporary landscape and what we got wrong. I mean, every single picture in this is sort of like a koan of, of a disaster. And this one, you know, it, well, go back, go back a little bit. Go back, go back, go back. Okay, so go to the next picture. Yeah, so, you know, this is from St. Augustine, Florida. So I went to photograph the, um, uh, where Ponce de Leon supposedly discovered the, um, the uh, Fountain of Youth. And there's this, you know, kitschy, pre-Walt Disney um, family uh, entertainment center with moving mechanical people describing the Fountain of Youth near where the Fountain of Youth is. But, you know, I had to take a pee at a certain point. So I'm looking for um, a bathroom and there's a Quonset all the way in the back. So I open up the Quonset door and I see this. So in the foreground it was what was a vitrine of Native American bones that were left there on a vitrine with a WPA painting in the background of all the thing of how horrifying Native Americans are. You know, they mm. sacrifice each other, put each other up on spits and eat each other, you know, and then there's the Quonset itself, which is like a chapel of death. Mm. So, you know, there's like everything that could go wrong is expressed in this sort of like, um, uh, you know, church of hell. Right. But the, but the thing, I mean, when I looked in the book and I came across this triptych, um, I'm hoping that you can see this, but that that the that that fan then becomes the basis for other the eye. portals. Yes, the other eye. The well, other because, eyes. Yes, because you know there's there's repeating motifs and imagery that blend one picture to another, even if they're not related specifically by subject matter. Mm -hmm. And so, if you go to the next picture, yeah, I mean, there in the landscape is supposedly a representative of the Miccosaki tribe with a gambling casino in the background that looks like a prison. I mean, you know, the kind of uh, strained poetry that was in that landscape was horrifying. And, um, you know, and, and in many of the, the um, highway signs in Florida, they're offering you the good life, but what mm. you see along the side of the road is garbage. Right. Or this, which is creepy beyond belief. <laughs> Treatment you know, for varicose and spider for varicose veins. veins, and it looked like you know a, a rapacious landscape, <laughs> like someone's getting eaten. Yeah, or this one, which I absolutely love. You know, uh, this was this I called uh, it, the the sign was called uh, what, what, I think the picture is called Nature 
push or pull, which was the description of what you needed to do. When you went to this diorama. Well, what, what I what I realized looking at this is that that the phone for German and the phone for Spanish both still use English to indicate what to do with them. <laughs> And then the then the other two are are some mystery language. Yeah, that is well, not specified. The whole thing is a mystery language to me, George. I got to tell you. And the raccoon, the raccoon looking down and and trying to say, well, if I could pick up that phone, I could tell a very different story. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the you know the the ironies and sadness in the landscape were apparent, and I had always wanted to photograph in Florida for a number of years after reading that Killing Mr. Watson books that were written by Peter Matheson. You know, mm -hmm. he wrote them twice. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know this, but he wrote the Killing Mr. Watson books, I think in the late 80s, he began them. And they were fantastic. And I just adored them. I, I'm a crazy, I was crazy about his writing. And then 20 years later, he thought he got it wrong. So we rewrote that trilogy of books again. Wow. And they were great again. I don't know wow. why he did it, but it was, it was nuts. But the landscape was so was the most beautiful part, the most beautiful character in those books. Mm -hmm. And so I had always wanted to go down and spend time and photograph in places like the Everglades and the Florida Keys. Right. It's very challenging, though, isn't it? I mean, it's a it's a very subtle, well, low lying landscape, not a lot of drama to it. It's true, it. although I seem to find it wherever I went. And so, you know, That's for the next wonderful. section, this section here, you know, I realized that in the um, in the Everglades has a section of Go Gonawana land, that area of the southern tip of Africa, that when the continents formed, floated and became attached to the southern tip of Florida. Hmm. This part of Africa became attached to the southern tip of Florida. And so this, there were limestone beds that were millions or billions of years old. So I went to photograph them. And I love photographing rocks because at a certain time of day, you can photograph them and train yourself to see in a way like a schizophrenic so that there's imagery in the patterns that seem to make sense. And this was the very one of the very first ones I made. And I just, you know, I just love this image because it looks like there's a it, there's a face staring out from billions of years. And I I paired these with ephemeral pictures of animal tracks. So I hired in the um, in the in the Keys and Everglades, I hired animal trackers to work with me, and I told them that their life was going to be very easy because I never wanted to kill anything. I wasn't going to carry a gun. I just wanted to see where the animals were and photograph their tracks. And you know, this was turtle tracks that looked like the Nazca Plains, you know, uh, drawings that um, from Peru, and so. Um, it was a, so I paired things that were very ephemeral with things that were ancient. Mm -hmm. And I called this section drawn from nature. Right. I'm trying to power through this a little bit. And these were in the show, these are remarkable pieces um, because well, you, yeah, invented, I, you invented some sort of printing method that just yeah. astonishing. The, I, this show was supposed to take place, be made and take place all in a year. And I drove the museum insane because I, I, you know, I found a way of going back there to photograph for two and a half years. And I was also inventing a printing process where I could gild silver leaf paper and print on it um, on an early version of digital printing, which people hadn't used yet to produce what looked like a 21st century daguerreotype or tintype. Right. And they were, how big, they're about 20 by 20? They were 20 by 27. Yeah, just gorgeous things. And I don't think anyone else has done, ever done them. Well, you know, now you can buy aluminum to print on and right. why, why would you bother? I wasn't, I ruined my dark room doing it. I had to make <laughs> a dark room so that I could do this thing. But I, I just wanted them to be not just images to see, you know, when I was a kid and I first went to photo school and I was first making pictures, I'd watch people walk through a photo gallery mm -hmm. real quickly. They yeah. get the image and they keep walking on. And yeah. my goal was to create something that was so arresting that you could look at it for years and it would change, mm -hmm. you know? And it's not what the medium was meant for, but 
um, it was, you know, an interesting ideal. I wanted, and I'm looking forward to the to the to the wonders section because it evolves so beautifully from these images that you know the the field of of black and white Grisaille almost uh, uh, visual aesthetics, and there it is. You know, if you weren't paying attention, you might think, oh, that's another one of the and pictures. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, I, it, to me, that's the closest, it's, you know, it, photography means drawing from life. And this was getting back to that. You know, when I first started out, I wanted to be the person who wasn't like anybody else. And so I worked in color. Of course, you know, back in 1971, there were how many photo artists in America? A couple hundred. <laughs> <laughs> How many hundreds of thousands are of there are there now? Well, and everyone so, everyone carrying one of these is a that's right. And now. so you know, hey, and there's nothing wrong with that either. But you know, the idea of it was uh, you know um, hubris to think about creating you know the, um, a world that you could call your own. But you know, their image like this one, which is an image I still particularly love, considering the work I've done since has all of that drawing from nature and also a zoomorphic image, just like theatrically planted inside of that water. You know, to me, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great gift to be able mm -hmm. to see some things like that. Right. Just being persistent, but also being patient and, and just watching. I mean, most of the time, I I'm guessing, and thinking from my own experience of being in, in deep wilderness, um, that you don't see what you've seen until you pick up the contact sheet or, you know, make the print. Well, there is that. You know, I, I, and I, and I, you know, I used to always say that processing film is a lot like what it must be for people like on Christmas morning, because everything looked so wondrous. And there were things I never expected to see. I mean, there's a picture coming up that, just blew my mind because it, it looked not yet, but I'll, I'll tell you when it comes. It was like something I'd never seen in a photograph before. It looked like a drawing. In fact, I have a friend of mine who's a fabulous painter who makes drawings just like that. Mm. And I thought, wow, you know, you know, and this the, the the tableau of a dance of imagery like this that one can put together um, by design in a photograph is just you know it's it's joyful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's this one here. To me, this looked like a steel engraving. Could have been done by Durer if right. he, you mm -hmm. know, if he had, if he had taken mushrooms and he was out in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a there's a um, parallel between density and intensity that I'm seeing here. Yeah, I mean, there's there's an intentional patterning that goes on. You know what? For me, what keeps a picture from falling apart is what happens at the edges. So you know, there's a perimeter that you know. I think there's there's a great po American poet Stanley Kunitz who who wrote about uh, gardens quite a bit. You know, I love his poetry. And he used to talk about this quite a bit, that a great piece of art is like a vessel that holds energy. Mm. If it's a poor piece of art, the energy leaks out very quickly. And so I often think about what the four corners of an image actually holds. I think um, I remember a photographer who worked with uh, Fred McDera said that, that McDera always wanted you to be sure that you pinned the corners. Yeah, yeah, well, it makes sense to me. Yeah, makes like you really made it work from corner to corner, and especially in the corners. Well, you know, a photography, like many other arts, is very attuned to what you leave out. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know, so. Oh, it's about what and, you, you know, have to. You have to leave so much more out than you can actually put in. That's right, and so you know what's what you're leaving in. It has to have an intentional quality to it, and. Um, you know, that's where uh, the pattern starts to show up. Otherwise, it would be noise. I mean, right. you know, I think what, what, what happens is that 
we become aware of new ideas from seeing a little bit of noise around the edge of the things that were normally sensible to us. Because cliche is the thing we understand so clearly that we don't really think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. But when we allow a little bit of noise in, just a little bit, all of a sudden the world opens up. Because, you know, the world is a chthonic place. It's a place with way more information than we could possibly understand. Mm -hmm. And we understand things through patterns. That's how mathematicians and scientists discover new ideas. And for image makers, it's the same. Mm -hmm. And musicians too. And you were making these images around that 2009, 2008, is that? Right yeah, right 2007 now? to 2009. Mm -hmm. And you were spending a oh. lot of time. I mean, this is relatively deep in the woods, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, you were talking about how horizontal the Florida landscape is. There are certain pockets of it that are not, but there are not many of them left. They're mm -hmm. called hummocks. Oh, they yeah. exist in, in the uh, Florida uh, Everglades and, and some in the Keys. Uh, but they are small remnants of what once were very wild forests. Mm -hmm. Still looks pretty wild. It was amazing, you know, and you know, you had to dodge alligators. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did, really? I dod you had to dodge alligators. You know, I, I would often go down in the fall and then uh, when, uh, you know, all the, uh, the tourists are gone and find myself tired at the end of the day and make tent uh, campsites um, along, uh, you know, camping grounds. Mm -hmm. And it would be very cautious about not being anywhere near alligators were hunting and in inevitably they would smack my tent in the middle of the night scare the bejesus out of me <laughs> and uh, yeah they were they were i saw many more alligators than i often saw people well i think there's a there's a funny uh gator anecdote coming up that i that i want to mm. get us to but here's here's that that image from the cryptic at the beginning of uh, the signs and wonders catalog yeah um, yeah. where, where something opens up in the, in the deep space and just transports you to another, like pulls you way, way into the image, deeper well, I, you than know, possible. Years before this, I had photographed sea caves in Southeast Asia. And to me, they were like portal, portals, you know, they were mm -hmm. like birthing sites. Mm -hmm. And in the Pacific Northwest, um, uh, there are enclosures that are made that are the equivalent of um, a transition from childhood to adulthood, where you would walk through uh, a vaginal canal of a bear and come out the other end as an adult. Mm. And I think about these things because um, caves were used this way for many thousands of years. And uh, these, tree, these trees that we're gonna look at in a minute too, were places where people were left to die before, um, as elders because it would take your spirit up. So there are right. these transitional moments in the landscape where we can move from one place to become something else. And I, I found that to be really powerful. Right. Um, the, next, the next image was almost a transformational image. Yeah. <laughs> this is in Shark Valley, Florida. This is, this is, your, this is your Catherine stand in the this middle is, of a yeah, road. This is Catherine from 30 years before. Um, and you know she was furious with me for making this picture because I, I I knew this bull alligator was there. I rode my bicycle very quickly down the road, set up my tripod to make this picture. And when Catherine came down, I waved at her so she wouldn't look down. And then showed her the picture a couple of weeks later, and she was furious with me. <laughs> but you know it's a it's a hilarious photograph. She likes very much now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know this was. <laughs> And I, you know, I and this was an image that was made while I was preparing to go to the museum for the opening. I went back into the Everglades just to photograph for one last day and to cool out before the, all the events that we were gathering together for. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I drove way into the um, into the Everglades, past Everglades City, and I found these two drunk women, absolutely drunk, and they couldn't figure out how to photograph each other. They, they had uh, a camera and a film, you know, canister kept on popping out. And so I, I slowed down and I said, you know, do you need any help? And I, I said, I'm a photographer, so I helped them. 
And this woman was describing how bereft she was. And it was this great image, you know, like it was almost a religious image and she's dressed uh, in camo. And you can't tell if this is a man or a woman, which I also really like. And she's in this landscape um, that looks like the camo she's wearing. I, I don't know, it was kind um, of- uh, I'm so glad it wasn't actually you. I was thinking, oh, there's Stuart posing for a selfie as <laughs> well, some yeah. you know, swamp creature. Well, she, went, she invited me to come to some, uh, you know, illegal um, drinking establishment that was just about another 12 miles down Oops. into the, the road and I, I passed that up. <laughs> <laughs> Wisely, I think. Here you are. Wait, who knows? Yeah, so, um, at the end of that project, I was exhausted. And so what I often do at the end of one project is I go camping in a place I don't know that well. And my teacher, also my very good friend, John Fall, who had lived in California before I met him, said, you know, Stu, you should go to Prairie Creek. It's a place where George Lucas filmed those scenes from Star Wars, and it's a great camping spot. So I went there and discovered, um, in the camp, campsite, uh, one of these hollow core trees. They're, um, they're trees that you know people during the depression lived in. There's one post office that still exists between California and Washington state. And some of these trees are still alive. They're, like I said before, they're, they can be 3000 years old. Um, as long as they're vertical and their roots are in the ground, they have canopies that are created above that have their own species and many other species of trees growing above mm -hmm. and animals that don't exist on the ground floor. Mm -hmm. So I started learning all about these trees at the same time that books started coming out about them for the very first time, because mm -hmm. botanists had thought that the, um, the canopy was a pretty dead zone and it's not at all. And young kids figured that out by using mountaineering techniques to get to the top of them. And then Susan, Suzanne Zamard started writing about how these trees communicate one to another. And most of these trees have been destroyed by our, um, by our own hubris because these trees were so big they could create a lot of wood, but we didn't realize how magical these creatures are, what they could teach us as well. And so I started looking for them um, and I spent a better part of eight or nine years photographing um, in every redwoods and sequoia forest I could looking for trees that had openings in them and tops that were blown off by, uh, by winds. And this, this, was a, this was a good example. I, I'd gone uh, to Yosemite to photograph sequoias and went to photograph a particular tree that took three days of driving to get to. And um, when I was talking to one of the rangers, because I had these little flashcards that described what I was doing, it was a guy who had been to Vietnam and learned photography there, loved the project and said, you know, the tree you're going to photograph is a tourist tree. But right be behind where the ranger station is, there's a tree that is the largest sequoia known to any of us. We don't tell anybody about it because we want to keep people from trampling its roots. Um, but I'm going to take you there. So he took me to this place and I went inside. I thought it was, I could feel my heart beating against my chest like I was going to have a heart attack. Mm. It was the one of the most beautiful things I'd seen, and it was this this site, um, uh, which you know, in each one of these is spectacularly beautiful. This is a redwood from Prairie Creek, hmm. but in some of them, the imagery is so profound. You know, you're you know, because of the way you're looking at these, it looks like you're looking straight ahead, but you're looking vertically straight up. Mm -hmm. But each one of these images is so profound. And it took me a few years to realize that if you were inside this funnel at the right 10 minutes during the day when the light hits it, all this bizarre imagery begins to form that looked like, you know, uh, uh, great engravings by, you know, by artists whose work I've loved over the years. And so, you know, and they were like Rorschachs. So mm -hmm. I would often see the tree and then take a compass reading, figure out when approximately that tree would get light the, towards the middle of the afternoon and go back the next day. And sometimes I was lucky like in this one here. Yeah. 
and uh, you know, and forgive the shameless self promotion, <laughs> but the very first um, iteration of a show is going to open in Santa Fe on April the 14. 14th with a reception on the 22nd, and you guys are all invited. Yay. All you people I cannot see, you're all invited. Um, thank you, Stuart. I've opened up, uh, anyone who wants to unmute themselves uh, at this point is free to do so, um, and uh, chime in, bring your voices in. Um, feel free to also go into the chat if you like. Um, but, uh, Stuart, it was a it was a remarkable opportunity. I got to go. I think Kevin took us into the into the Everglades a little bit. I mean, it, yeah. it was it was my first experience, and I I have to admit to being both overwhelmed and underwhelmed. I mean, I was I was impressed that you had found all the spaces you found, and the space that I was in, I, I remember it seeming very tame. You know, well, most of them are. Most of them are, but you know, I found places that were not. And um, you know, uh, uh, if you ever want to go to a place that's not very tame, go to Everglade City. It's a mind blowing place. And and read uh, Killing Doc, Killing Mr. Watson, because the Mr. Watson tr a, a trilogy of books, that landscape has not changed all that much either. Nor there, nor has the avarice that created the story. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, how far away is Oculus from, from being a book? Well, that's a damn good question. I thought, you know, I, uh, about a year ago, I started shopping the book around to just a few publishers. And um, I got uh, Craig, um, uh, I got, for, first of all, I got Wade Davis, the, the great writer, interested in writing a, an introduction. Um, he loved the work and was going to write an introdu introduction. And then um, uh, um, boy, I'm blanking. Um, Someone in, in Wade's circle? Craig, yeah. And Craig, no, and an, a great architect, Craig Dykers, who's the CEO of Snowheta that built the uh, SF MoMA, uh, the Norwegian Opera House. Um, is a lover of these pictures, and he also wrote a small piece um, for it. And I thought, you know, with these two great writers, um, I'm not that well known, but they are. I could, you know, I could parlay that into a uh, a book proposal. But so far, nobody's taken up the reins. Where, you know, and so the reason for this show in Santa Fe is there's some great foundations there. Um, there's a publisher there, and I'm trying to, you know, to raise the heat up. Mm -hmm. on interest for this project and if not you know that is the way the world goes but what do you what do you think these days is the is the key uh, component to getting books published well you know the world is a fierce place as anybody that's been alive as long as we have known and there's a lot of things going on right now that are of great import um you know, the there racial injustice that's been uh, preeminent in the United States for our, our entire life has come to a head. Um, what's going on in Ukraine and, and, uh, and in Africa has come to a head. So these issues are of supreme importance. And my, um, my kind of uh, imagery about um, places for healing and thinking about the way the, the earth offers um, medicine for us may not be the most important thing at the moment. But, you know, it is an important element of our survival is to think about how the world can be for us yeah. the answer that we need. Um, I mean, I'm old fashioned enough to think of, to look at the Oculus images and think, oh my God, those are going to look so beautiful in a fine reproduction in a large format book. You know, I yeah. Mean, and, and, from your lips, yeah. from your lips to whosoever's ears. Right, right. <laughs> it's kind of a kind of an older fashioned notion these days. Well, there is that, but you know, I I make I make photographs. The best of my pictures are made as, in some ways, as like meditation devices. They're like machinery. Mm -hmm. They're not made, meant as documents, and documents are really important right now. But this machinery for change is what I'm interested in. So you know, I'm hitting for the I'm hitting homers for the ages, um, whether that 
home run hits um, while I'm alive or not is unknown to me. Mm. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that work like this. They, they are doing what they think is extremely important, but it might not be absolutely timely. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, when you mentioned John Fall, I have a warm spot in my heart for him, in part because um, you told me that he read my essay from the book. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I got the feeling that the, that the essay that I wrote was a little quote heavy. And that was, that was something that came back from John, like, oh, I love that he used, the, you know, Ecclesiastes and Emily Dickinson. And um, I don't, you may not remember this, this reference, but um, it, it came, it came out as a, as a very nice criticism. Well, that was John. And also, you know, John loved me dearly and would always describe me as his son, but he was competitive with me specifically, like a father is with his son. And so, you know, he was probably jealous you didn't write that for him. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, he would have loved it if you had written it for him, believe me. Um, there, there's many, many of his series of works that I've always loved. Um, me too. And, and at one point in my life, I was thinking a lot about piles. And, <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, piles are really interesting. You know, they, they represent a kind of set of decisions that someone's made and they have certain physical limits and and I was putting a show together to recognize Roger Merton and um, and I, I knew John knew knew Roger and asked him to send me a couple of pictures for a tribute section of the show and I open up the box from John and it's pictures from a series that I'd never known about called piles <laughs> and sure enough he had he had taken this idea right out of my head and and like made it into these most beautiful, these, the way that he printed and the way that he thought and looked at the world was so gentle and probing at the same time. Yes, you know, there, was, there were great qualities in his work that people often aren't privy to anymore because there's a sophistication to his humor and intelligence that's subtle. And subtlety, you know, is not a real great quality in the world today, you need to be very loud to be heard. But John's work was subtle and deep. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he, I don't know if you know this, but he had cancer three times and beat it three times. Wow. And the third time he was going in for um, a cancer treatment, I went to visit him after, right before leaving the country for a year. And I was worried I would never see him again. So I went and spent time with him in the hospital. And he said to me, if I ever, if I get out of this, when I was a little boy, I read about a place in Indonesia I always wanted to visit. Would you take me there? And I said, yeah. So he, uh, he did get better. He was sickly, but he came and visited with me for two months and we photographed together. And he made a picture of a pile um, that's left over from offerings at the major temple in, in Bali at Basaki Temple. That's one of my very favorite John Fall pictures and nobody knows it. It's just a spectacular image. And it's got like a hide and seek thing like I like to do that he knows that I like to do in pictures that he did for me. Mm -hmm. So it speaks particularly to me. It's up in my house. And when you come to visit, I'll show it to you. Nice, nice. Well, I see a bunch of people who are hanging out there. Um, someone raised a hand maybe or, yep, Sandra, you need to unmute yourself. Hi, Stuart. <laughs> oh my God, it's Sandy. This is someone who knew John too. <laughs> but I do have a quote. Well, first of all, thank you. This has been, just, it was great seeing all of your work and how you think about it. And very, it was very inspirational. Um, I do have a little question about between when you were photographing the landscape then and what's going on with the environment now wildfires, tornadoes, has that influenced how you might approach your next project or? You know, I, it's, a good, it's a really good question. And it's a really good question and they, it, I, I hope I'm gonna answer it in a way that makes sense. But um, about two years ago, my brother began to die. And, um, and so that took front and center, for me, that was my entire landscape. 
and and he was dying in San Francisco in the middle of all the wild wildfires. So the day he died in the morning, there was no sunlight. It was midnight in San Francisco at eight o'clock in the morning. And all you could see was a blood orange sun. Mm. Um, that was the landscape I had been living with while I was taking care of him on uh, the last few months of his life. And when I came back, I was so devastated. I thought my career as an image maker was over. I had nothing left in me. And so I got, uh, my wife and I got a couple of floating kayaks and we started just um, kayaking in the Schuylkill River, not far from where we live. And I started making pictures there. Um, and one of them was a reflection of Laurel Hill Cemetery, which is one of the oldest cemeteries in Philadelphia, which has some of the oldest cemeteries in the United States. And in it, looked, it looked like very much like um, a high of Soutine landscape in water. Um, was kind of very psychedelic, but it was like uh, the image of the Valley of the Dead. So I don't know how you can live in the world and not be influenced by it, but I don't ever choose to do things. Um, um, I don't ever choose a project like John did um, conceptually ahead of time. You know, John would choose a project and say, I'm going to do this. And three months later, it would be done. And it was a problem he always found in my work is that it would sometimes take me 10 years to reveal what it is to myself that I was looking at, because it seems to be something that seeps in your DNA. So the fires, the death, all of that, it gets translated through your body in a way you never expect. And that's the magical part of being um, a curious and creative person. <laughs> Long, long answer, and actually sort of a non-answer, Stuart. <laughs> yeah, I only only because only because it's the it's the only kind of answer you could give to the question of what are you doing next. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I never know. Yeah, I, I had a friend years ago, uh, Holly Roberts, who's still a friend, who once gave a lecture. And she said this really smart thing. She said, you know, artists are either dreamers or hunters. So uh, a dreamer has an idea like John Fall who reveals it, find, knows exactly what they're looking for and they reveal it. Mozart was like that. But then there were, there are most of us are hunters. And I, to me, I always described it like being in a dark room with a weak flashlight is that I'm trying to figure out what it is, what the world is like. And it, you know, it reveals itself very slowly and often by coincidence or what we see as coincidence. Stuart Clipper, I, I, I am thinking that you might enjoy Stuart Rome's shirt. And I was wishing that you were wearing one of one of your dearly beloved shirts this evening. You know, I've always wanted to meet this guy. Let me see what he looks like. <laughs> I, know. I mean, and we both spell the name the correct way too. That's right. Stuart, you know, what a pleasure. You know, I've always wanted to meet you. Hey, thank you. It's good to meet you and, you know, yeah. also in a small rectangle. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, I, I'm, I was looking at your Everglades thing and I've, I've taken myself on my own, for my own uh, peculiar reasons into the rainforest and I was concerned with um, placing myself in some of the greatest concentrations of DNA. Yeah. Uh, and you feel that when you get in that. But I've also been on the road a few times with, with Friedlander. And he'll go into anything that's dense with his, with his uh, Hasselblad. And uh, so, I saw, so I just felt some very nice poetic connections between you and the Everglades and all these places that Lee gets lost in. Uh, and uh, I, I always know where he is because he's always, he always uses a flash. <laughs> so he can go into some dense thicket and I, you know, I just wait to see a flash coming out of somewhere. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I just felt very nice, the uh, resonance between the, your, your pictures there, so. Yeah. 
Well, you know, it's interesting. When uh, the year before, I guess that book, The Desert Scene, came out, I was still I was still working in Indonesia. I was out of the country, and um, and I was very good friends with Ray Metzger, who was mm -hmm. beginning to make pictures in that same sort of language. So I, you know, I came back and I thought I had discovered a new way of making photographs. Then I saw a desert scene and I realized Lee, Free, Lee Friedlander was using that very same language. And so was Ray Metzger. And I just thought, you know, it was something that was in the air, this idea of horror vacui, a way of creating a pattern um, out of something that, you, that didn't look like it had a pattern that was already established. Mm -hmm. And I love that work about them, but they, you know, they got there before me. And speaking of in the air, um, yeah, it was me too, around 1970-71. Uh, I thought all of the, um, the prejudices against color, well, you know, it was bullshit, you know, and I just, so, uh, and over the years, I mean, I, I'm pretty much on my own making this decision. And over the years, as I, you know, just like now with you, something was in the air with, a, you know, a certain type of photographer that uh, it just seemed like, why bother dealing with these prejudices? Just throw some color in the camera. And, yeah. Absolutely. You know, in 1971, uh, you know, I think it was, that was the year, wasn't that the year that Robert Frank, somebody said, asked him about color photography and he said, the only colors in photography are black and white. Black and white. And I, you know, as a kid, you know, as a kid who was like 18 years old, you know, all you, somebody says something like that to you, you want to prove them wrong. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, that's basically it too. You know, I'm thinking in my own terms about, you know, it's a medium of abstraction, no matter what. And, uh, yes. you know, so color is just, there it is. It's I mean, a, I've never stopped working in black and white. I've always kept that sort of complementarity going, but. Uh, well, well color, color is a more subtle form of, of lying that photography undertakes. Yeah. Well, you know, that's become a problem too, because until like the 2000s, there was still the, the, the question that the photograph was truthful, you know, and you could play on that, that sort of like pressure for a long time, not because of Photoshop that don't, no longer exists. But you know, and color is uh, trickier than black and white in many ways because the abstraction that black and white makes very clear is sometimes lost in color because color is the way we see the world. So you have to be really canny about how you use it, mm -hmm. as, Stuart, as Stuart Clipper knows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a friend here, uh, he used Peter Latner and he, he always used to have a business card. Uh, it's, that, that said, yeah, the, the camera never lies. Peter Latna, honest photographer. <laughs> uh, um, so many, so many wonderful comments. It, it, anyone else uh, interested in chiming in before we wind up here? I just wanted to mention um, my gratitude to everyone who's shown up tonight and all of the people who have shown up regularly for photo book banters over the last year. And it has been a year now that we've been doing this. Um, and I um, am going to put uh, the regular monthly conversations on hiatus for a little while. I have a bunch of things that I need to attend to in, in, in my life. Um, and I have a handful of photographers who are really eager to do um, to do banters, uh, maybe at the end of the summer. Um, so this is not I, I won't I won't say goodbye, but I'll say until next time. Um, it's it'll it'll be great to have you join us again, or it would be great to join you again, and see you um, later this year. But thank you, Stuart Rome. You have you have been a, a wonderful guest and a good friend over many years. Um, we trace. George, you, you've honored me tonight oh. by letting me do this. So thank you very much. Well, the honor is mine. The honor is mine. Stuart Clipper has his hand up. Oh no, I was saying, I was saying, you got to start in again sometime. Okay. Yeah. It'll it'll thank happen. Thank you, George, for what you've been doing. <laughs>
Oh, yeah. thanks. Thanks, John. Yeah. All, right. All right, everyone. Well, I will, I've recorded this and I'll put it up on the George Slade YouTube channel along with uh, last month's Zoom bombed uh, conversation with, with Mona. I think some of you were here for that. That was quite an intriguing little moment. Um, and, and I feel almost fortunate that I have it recorded because it'll be an example for years to come or maybe days. But anyway, um, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day and month and we'll be in touch. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye, Sandy. I still. <laughs>